Hi, this is Jim Wright again, and in this lesson we will discuss some general milling techniques and tips. We aren't going to cover anything in Solid Edge Cam Pro, so if you've been working in a machine shop for a while, you can probably feel pretty safe in skipping this lesson. In the last couple of lessons, we have talked about different types of cutting tools and different types of cut patterns, but we haven't really explained what they are. So I think maybe we should backtrack for a little bit and explain some of those things. So let's get started. Face mills. A face mill is not a center cutting tool. Look at the face mills on the screen. None of them will cut to center. There are other tools that will cut to center, but a face mill will not cut to center and that's important. Typically with a face mill we have to start the cutting process off to the side of the work material. For other types of milling we need other types of tools. So let's talk about end mills for just a second. End mills come in a large variety of designs. They really are the workhorse of the milling world. A center cutting end mill is one that has one flute that crosses the center line. And what that means is they can be used for ramping into material. A center cutting end mill can be used for ramping or helical engage. And that's important in closed off areas where a typical face mill could not reach into that area. So we will see a lot of ramping, a lot of helical engages being used and when we do that it must be a center cutting end mill. A non-center cutting end mill as you see in the picture here cannot be used for ramping because what happens is a bit of the material that isn't cut will start pushing up on the bottom of the tool and very quickly the tool will be broken. So don't use a non-center cutting end mill for any ramping or helical engage motion. Here are some representations of different types of end mill. The one to the farthest left is what we would call a flat end mill. In other words, there isn't a corner radius on the tool itself. Second from the left, we have a radius end mill or sometimes called a bull nose end mill. And it has a radius on the tool. So in this particular example, we have a 10 millimeter tool with a 3 millimeter radius and of course that 3 millimeter radius is on both sides of the tool that results in a 4 millimeter effective cutting width. So when we talked about step overs earlier and we said we wanted to do a 50% step over, that 50% step over will be applied to the 4 millimeter effective flat diameter which means that our step overs will be 2 millimeters. The third picture we see is what we call a ball nose end mill. And a ball nose end mill is, as the name describes, the end of the tool is spherical. So obviously, step overs of a certain flat diameter would not apply here at all. Typically, when we calculate step overs using a ball nose end mill, we're talking about a scallop height. And when we get into the three axis section of our lesson plan, we'll explain what a scallop height is. And finally, the last picture is a drafted end mill that has a ball on the end of it, or a tapered ball nose end mill. A drafted or tapered end mill is used a lot for mold and die work. To retrieve an object out of a mold, the walls have to be tapered. They cannot be vertical. So we, we use the drafted part of the end mill to machine the wall while we're machining some of the radiuses on the floor. We also have reduced shank end mills. In this particular example, we have a 10 millimeter cutting diameter, but the shank is reduced to eight millimeters. This allows us to not rub the shank of the end mill on the wall of an object that we're cutting. Coated end mills have a very hard coating that's been applied to them. Usually it's some form of super hard material applied to a fairly durable cutter so that the edges will stay sharper longer. 
An indexable end mill, instead of having flutes that are ground onto it, has replaceable inserts. And so these inserts can be replaced by the machine operator as they get dull, and this allows you to keep reusing the tool for much longer than you would a typical ground end mill. Specialty cutters like T cutters, dovetail cutters, and radius cutters allow you to form certain geometry relatively easily. So what are drills? Well, they're used to make holes, but they come in all kinds of different varieties. We have center drills, spot drills, core drills, spade drills, countersinks, counterbores, boring bars, reamers, taps, and thread mills. All these are used in some kind of hole making fashion. We won't discuss all of them here, but I do want to discuss a couple of them. On the left, we have a spade drill with a replaceable bit. On the upper right, we have a spot drill. This is typically used to create a starter hole so that when you start to drill the hole, uh, the tool doesn't wander off. And, and in the lower right, we have a, a twist drill that has coolant holes through it to help keep the tool at lower operating temperature and also flush the chips out of the hole as you're drilling. Here are some taps and thread mills. These are used to make threaded holes. Another thing I wanted to talk about is climb versus conventional milling. You can see in the little graphic on the right hand side, the tool is spinning in a clockwise manner and we're removing material as a climb milling function. So if you look at the graphic at the bottom of the screen, you can see that the chip starts out very thick and ends up very thin. That is the ideal cutting condition. If we can do this type of cutting, we prefer it. The problem is we can't always use climb milling. For example, if you can think about as that tool spins around and around in a clockwise fashion, there's a tendency for it to grab the part and pull it in the direction that the tool is going. If your setup is not very rigid, this can cause a lot of chatter. If the setup is very loose, it can even cause the part to be thrown out of the machine. So climb milling, while preferred, can't always be used. Here's a graphic of the tool as it moves along. I like to equate it to a, a car driving down the road. As you drive your car down the road, the wheels are going in a climb milling fashion. They're in contact with the road, but at the same time, they're going in the same direction as the car is, so there's not a lot of resistance. Conventional milling, on the other hand, the chip goes from thin to thick, and because there's less tendency to grab the part and try to pull it, it's a better cutting style for non-rigid setups. However, it is harder on the tool and the tools won't last as long when you're doing conventional milling. So keep that in mind. If we go back to that analogy of the car going down the road, let's imagine that you parked in an illegal parking spot and the tow truck came to move your car. However, you're still in the driver's seat, you've got the engine turned on, and you put it in drive and you hit the gas. The tires in this case are going to be conventional milling. I often get asked this question, what is a good spindle speed and feed rate? And the answer is it depends on a lot of things. What is the tool material? What is the part material? How rigid is the setup? And rigidity, as you'll find, is very important to subtractive machining. The more rigid the setup is, generally speaking, the faster we can machine. The less rigid a setup is, the slower we have to go. If you're working in a machine shop, the likelihood is that they already have a set of feeds and speeds that they have for most of the materials that they machine. So I would say consult people that you're working with define what speeds and speeds work for the cutting conditions in your shop. If you're starting from scratch, there are lots of resources out there to help you. Uh, so I suggest a simple internet search on cutting feeds and speeds calculator, and that should give you some idea of at least where to start with feeds and speeds for your particular environment. So, given what we know at this point, ZIG 
is the perfect cut pattern. All the step overs are equal. The tool always cuts in the same direction, regardless of whether you've set it to climb or conventional. And since the material removal rate never changes, feed rates can be set at the maximum for that tool and material combination. However, both Zig and its cousin Zigzag have problems. What do we do with pockets that are irregularly shaped or island geometry? That's when we run into trouble. Toolpath scientists came up with the follow part, follow periphery cut pattern that we've discussed before. Basically, it's an offset from the wall or any islands and machines the entire area. So we've solved the problem again, right? Well, not completely. If we watch this tool as it proceeds through this cut, you can see that right now we have a 50% step over. In other words, the radial depth of cut is 50%. But when we get to the end of the pass, we have now encountered a full diameter cut. Some NC programmers will refer to this as burying the tool in the cut. So to compensate for this, we would have to adjust the feed rate or make some other modifications so that we don't break the tool. As we clear out the corner, we start to get a better cutting tool condition again. But then as we proceed to the next spot, we again begin to bury the tool in the cut. The toolpath scientist looked at the offset cut pattern and said, maybe we can help. Maybe we can apply path smoothing. So if you look at the path smoothing cut pattern, you can see that it does help. It changes that sharp corner into a rounded radius. And then of course, in certain areas where we're not machining all the material, we have to add some extra motion to get that entirely cut. But even with path smoothing, we're not 100% effective because we still have these areas where the tool will be buried in the cut. Now we have a new cut pattern called adaptive roughing that solves those problems. All the step overs are uniform. If the tool ever comes to a point where it needs to remove extra material, we simply retract and re-engage and then take that next pass. Because of that, the toolpath itself is much, much longer than a traditional toolpath. However, because we can run the speed at maximum spindle speed and maximum feed rate all the time, the cutting time is actually less. Oh, and more good news, the cutting tools will last longer because you never bury them in the cut. Here's what the adaptive roughing toolpath looks like in simulation mode. You can see the tool has a nice, consistent step over all the way through machining this geometry. Retracts and re-engages wherever it needs to, to continue that nice, smooth, easy motion. This is the ideal cutting pattern if we can apply it. We'll explore this cutting pattern when we get into our next lesson. That's all for this lesson. I'll see you again soon. Thanks.